The Peter Schiff Show. Well, and then there was one. Donald Trump is now the presumptive Republican presidential nominee for 2016. And I remember when this Republican primary started and the field was very wide. I was, what was it, 16 people or so uh, that were of the major candidates. And they had, you know, they had to split the debates up between the, uh, the main event and the undercard because they had so many different candidates. And nobody in the mainstream really gave Donald Trump a shot. Everybody wrote him off. It was kind of like a joke candidacy. And even though I wasn't supporting Trump, I was supporting Rand Paul. And then more recently, uh, Ted Cruz, as far as the people who I think ideologically were the closest to to me, I always thought that Donald Trump was a very serious candidate and thought that he probably had the best odds of winning. And in fact, that's what happened. I mean, I never wrote the guy off. I always recognized the appeal of his message. And I know that the economy is much worse than people believe, than is generally perceived. And If you're your typical guy living in a rotten economy, Trump seems to be the candidate that's going to appeal to you. And he's not saying anything that is going to get anybody concerned because he's not talking about cutting Social Security or uh, doing anything that is taking away government benefits. His message is he's trying to be all things to all people as far as saying what everybody wants to hear. In that sense, it's a populist message in that everybody's going to win. Just elect me, and I'm going to make all your problems go away. How am I going to make them go away? Because I'm different. I'm not your typical politician. I'm a billionaire businessman who knows what he's doing. And everybody in in government, well, they're a bunch of incompetent fools. And he's right about that part. Everybody in government is an incompetent fool. But that doesn't mean replacing him uh, for an incompetent fool is going to be a panacea to immediately make these problems go away. But you know what? Why not take a shot at it, right? Because nothing else has worked. So I knew that his message was powerful and it would resonate. And in fact, the way everybody is writing him off to lose to Hillary Clinton, saying that, oh, it's having Trump as the Republican nominee, well, that's just handing the White House to Hillary Clinton. I don't believe so. I think the media is still underestimating Donald Trump, Despite the fact that he completely surprised them by winning the Republican nomination, he might surprise them again by winning the general election and being our next president. Because if you are anti-establishment, why would you vote for Hillary Clinton, even if you are a Democrat? I mean, why do you think Bernie Sanders continues to get so much support? He beat Hillary again. He beat her in Indiana yesterday. But of course, Hillary's got such a massive lead thanks to all these super delegates, that it doesn't even matter how many primaries he wins. He can win all the primaries from now until the election, and Hillary is still going to be the nominee unless Bernie Sanders can flip these delegates, these super delegates. Now, maybe if she gets indicted between now and the convention, well, maybe that maybe that will do the trick. But, you know, Hillary Clinton couldn't win in uh, in Indiana because there weren't enough minorities there. I mean, when when you just look at your basic, uh, you know, non-minority population, they're overwhelmingly going for Bernie Sanders. And the reason they're doing that is for the same reason that Republicans are going for Donald Trump. And I said many times, I think that Donald Trump is going to be able to tailor his message specifically to appeal to the Bernie Sanders Democrats. Now, he's not going to get all of the Bernie Sanders Democrats, the ones that are real far left socialists. But believe me, there's a lot of people who are voting for Bernie Sanders just because they can't stand Hillary Clinton. And Trump has got a good shot at getting those people. In fact, I think Donald Trump can do better with the Democrats than Ronald Reagan. And it was those Reagan Democrats that really put Ronald Reagan into the White House. And many people are too young to remember uh, but when Ronald Reagan first got the uh, the nomination, the media said, well, that's it. He's going to lose in a landslide. Nobody thought he could beat Jimmy Carter. 
He was an incumbent president. And Ronald Reagan was so far to the right, he was even to the right of Barry Goldwater. And Barry Goldwater got completely demolished when he ran against Lyndon Johnson. And so everybody thought, well, this is just going to be another Barry Goldwater. The Republicans have gone out and nominated somebody so extreme, so far to the right, that it's going to be an embarrassment. He's going to be completely destroyed. In fact, for a while, even when he got the nomination, people were so scared that there was pressure for him to put Gerald Ford as his VP, right? A former president on the ticket. But Reagan didn't want to share the spotlight with Gerald Ford. And eventually, you know, he took uh, a, a Bush and, you know, trying to moderate himself a little bit uh, by nominating a moderate and, you know, trying to get, uh, you know, a Texan. Uh, but he ended up winning in a landslide. And so the same thing could happen with Donald Trump. By the way, I put out an article on my website today, Make America Great Again, uh, about Donald Trump and about, uh, you know, tariffs and protectionism and making America great again. So it's it's a good article. Uh, it's only not even a thousand words. I think about 900 or a thousand words or something like that. But it's on my website. Give it a read. I'm not going to get into it because I've talked about some of that stuff already on, on, on past podcasts. But go and read the article. And I'm sure by the end of the day, that article will be on other websites, too. So you might see it around the Internet. But but give it a read. I wrote it early this morning, uh, knowing that it would be good to have it out today because you had uh, Ken Cruz conceded last night. Kasich just conceded today. And so now uh, the field is clear. The only now uh, drama is going to be on the Democratic side. And I actually think that uh, Kasich and Cruz dropping out is going to be good for Sanders because now the media is not going to be covering the Republican race as much because it's already settled. So now you have that vacuum in all the coverage. So now it's going to go to the Democratic race. And there's the contestant. There's the contested race. And this is going to help Sanders. And it's going to build on his momentum. And so I think he's going to continue to win primaries against Hillary Clinton. And, you know, and that is going to make it harder and harder for Hillary uh, at the convention, knowing that so many people have, in fact, voted against her. And that is what a lot of people are doing, too, when they vote for Sanders. I mean, there are some people that are voting for Sanders, but there's a lot of people that are voting against Hillary Clinton. And all of this is going to work to Donald Trump's favor, because the more people who don't vote for Hillary Clinton in the primary, the more people who vote for Sanders and then are upset that Sanders is not the nominee. And unfortunately, they've got Hillary Clinton who they don't like, they may decide that Donald Trump is the lesser of those two evils, especially when he's saying all the right things about creating jobs and he's anti-NAFTA. And remember, it was Hillary Clinton's husband, Bill Clinton, he gave us NAFTA. And so you've got all these Sanders people that hate free trade and hate NAFTA. Why are they going to vote uh, for the godmother of NAFTA? Why don't they vote for Donald Trump? So the media is writing him off. I'm not writing him off. Now, people ask me, are you going to vote for him? Look, I live in Connecticut, so I'm probably going to vote uh, for the libertarian candidate, and it's probably going to be Gary Johnson. And so I'm probably going to vote for him because it doesn't really matter who I vote for, because I think Hillary is going to win Connecticut. That's how lost uh, Connecticut is. But I tell you, if it turns out that Connecticut is in play, if, you know, a few days before I go to vote and it's a close call, then I would vote Trump because I don't want to vote for Hillary. And if it's a close call, voting for uh, Sanders would be a vote for Hillary. And I've got some problems with Trump, but I would I would certainly prefer Trump over over Hillary Clinton. So I would vote him if I thought it was a close enough race. But if I know it's not a close race and I really want to vote my conscience and I want to vote for the best candidate running, not the candidate who I don't think is as bad as the alternative. If I want to vote for the best candidate, then I'd vote for Gary Johnson. And I, I would say the same thing to anybody who lives in a state where it's overwhelmingly going to go. Uh, for either the Republican or the Democrat. If you know your vote's not going to matter, then vote Libertarian. You know, just give them some support. Let's help get those vote totals up. But if you're in a swing state, you know, you live in Ohio or something, you can't you can't do that. We need you to go out there and, and vote for Trump, uh, despite the fact that he's not a perfect candidate. Nobody is. So the question is, which candidate has the fewest flaws that, of the of the candidates that potentially could win. I want to get into some of the economic data that came out today. It was a there was a lot of data out today. It was a data packed day. And in fact, it was a mixed bag. Some of the data actually came out better than expected, which is very rare because generally all the data comes out worse than expected.
The main data point that came out of the day was way worse than expected. And this is the ADP employment report for April, right? So this is the first month of the second quarter that's supposed to have this big snapback, right? From the very, very weak first quarter. They were looking for 194,000 or 193,000 jobs to be created. Uh, and that would have been a slight decline from the 200,000 that they told us we created in March. Well, the actual number came out at 156,000. Big, big miss. In fact, this is the fewest number of jobs created in about three years, uh, according to the ADP number. So that is a big slowdown in job creation. And then to make it worse, they even knocked, took away 6,000 jobs from last month. So it went down from 200,000 to 194. Uh, so this is a very, very big miss. And of course, again, manufacturing, we lost jobs. I think it was 13,000 manufacturing jobs, 14,000 jobs. I forget exactly. But we lost goods producing jobs. Again, where are the jobs gains coming from? Low paying jobs in the service sector, part time jobs. You know the story. But now we're creating fewer of those jobs. So this is a bad number. And I'm actually surprised that we didn't get a bigger reaction in the markets. I mean, the stock market was down again today, and it's had a pretty bad losing streak. In fact, the, the NASDAQ is now almost back in correction territory. I think it's down about 9.5% again from the highs. It never actually made it to a full bear market last time, but then it rallied back almost back to where it started. And now it's been declining almost every day for the past couple of weeks. Uh, the Dow was down as well, down almost 100 points. But the dollar was stronger ever since yesterday morning. Yesterday morning, the dollar index made a new low for the year, a new low in over a year. It got down below 92, like 91 something. And then it had a reversal. And now it gained more today. And it's back, you know, just above 93. Gold was down about five or six bucks today, but it was down about 15 or $16 earlier in the day. And it was also down a bit yesterday, again, after getting slightly above 1300 couldn't hold it so we've been twice above it we're back down to about 1280 which used to be the, the old high and now we've pulled back very very normal meanwhile gold stocks have been slammed gold stocks were down five percent today alone five percent that is 10 times the decline in gold percentage wise and from yesterday morning so from monday morning's open to Wednesday's close, you've got a 10% decline in the GDX. Now, you know, this is normal action for a, a bull market. Because normally in a bull market, the most violent moves are down. It's in the opposite direction. Why is that? Because bull markets, they climb a wall of worry. And the worry is created by sharp declines. So when you have these big moves, that's to shake out the weaker longs. That creates the fear that builds the wall of worry that all bull markets have to climb. So when you get this action, this is typical. I know it's scary, but this is par for the course. The big moves are always going to be to the downside. When the big moves are to the upside, that's usually the capitulation or that the final, the final end of a market, or that's before you have a major correction is when you have big gaps to the upside, boom, 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 then maybe you'll have a pullback. It's maybe the, 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 the skeptics are capitulating, they're joining the party, you have euphoria. But right now, it's the fear that rules the market. And people get scared and they, and they jump out and you get these big, big moves down. And so that's what we're seeing. And so I'm not worried about it at all. I think this is still early stages of a big, big bull market in these gold mining stocks. So don't let the noise shake you out. But I'm sure some people that finally dipped their toe in the water, maybe yesterday, the day before, because they got, you know, they got excited and now maybe they got they got stopped out. Now I think the catalyst for the gold sell-off were the comments made Monday morning by Atlanta Fed President Dennis Lockhart, who basically said a June rate hike was on the table. And I don't know why anybody still goes for this. I mean, is it on the table? I don't think so. But if it's there, nobody's reaching for it. In fact, if you look at the uh, the probability that the markets are placing on a June rate hike, it's only about 10%, regardless of Dennett Lockhart's talking about the fact that it's on the table. But, you know, he also talked about, he said that the markets were underestimating the probability of a June rate hike. And I think what he said is he thought it was more likely that they would raise rates than they wouldn't. So it was actually some pretty strong comments uh, from Lockhart about why the Fed is getting ready to raise rates. But believe me, if the Fed actually raised rates, this correction that we have now in the stock market would, would become a, a full-blown bear market.
And even if the Fed does raise rates slightly, despite the fact that the economy is decelerating rapidly and despite the fact that corporate earnings are collapsing, I don't even think it would be bearish for gold because the last rate hike wasn't bearish for gold either. So I think another trivial rate hike uh, would be bullish for gold. Even if there was a short term decline, it would be another buying opportunity. But I don't buy this for a minute. The data is just too weak and the election is too close for the Fed to actually take a chance at raising rates again, given what a big disaster it was when they raised rates in December. But let's get back to the economic data. Oh, and by the way, too, we know that we get the non-farm payroll, the official government number. This was the private sector. We get the, the total numbers from the government, and that's the one that the market tends to pay the most attention to. And we get that on Friday. And if that's anywhere near as bad as the ADP number that we got today, I would expect a pretty big move. Now, on the trade front, we got the trade deficit for March, and it was already expected to decline quite a bit from the February deficit of $47.1 billion, which they only revised slightly lower to $47 billion. So February was a particularly bad month, and they were looking for the deficit to narrow to $41.4 billion, and it actually narrowed a little more. It narrowed to $40.4 billion. So that in and of itself is good news because it's a smaller trade deficit, which means that we'll subtract less from the uh, first quarter GDP than a larger deficit would have meant. But if you look beneath the surface at how we got there, it would be very troubling because imports collapsed. It was the biggest drop in imports in seven years, and the net level is at a five-year low. That's bad. I mean, it would, be, it would be good if imports were dropping because we were producing more stuff ourselves, but that's not the case. In fact, exports were down too. Both imports and exports went down. It's just that imports went down more. And I think the reason that imports are going down is because Americans are too broke to buy the imported products. Because, you know, 70% of our GDP number comes from consumer spending. And unfortunately, a lot of what consumers buy, the products are imported. And if consumers are broke and they're not spending, then obviously we're not importing. And also that's a function of the bloated inventories. If companies have inventories that they can't sell, why do they need to import even more products? So beneath the surface, even though the trade deficit was not as horrific as it could have been, uh, the numbers tell a story of a weakening economy that should be very, very troubling for the bull. So I would chalk that up in the negative category, even though it, it wasn't. Then we got the productivity numbers. Uh, for the first quarter. And here it's kind of uh, a, a push, I would say, because, uh, or actually maybe slightly good news, but productivity dropped by 1% in the first quarter of, of this year. It was supposed to drop by 1.2%. So productivity fell, but a little less than we thought. And the decline from the second quarter of last year was revised smaller. So the original decline was 2.2%. And now they're saying it only was 1.7% decline. But the, the fact of the matter is we have two back-to-back -back quarters of declining productivity. That ain't good. No matter how you look at it, that is bad news. And I think it's going to get worse. Meanwhile, on the, on the uh, unit labor cost front, uh, last quarter's increase of 3.3 was revised to down 2.7. But the 3.5% increase they were expected in the first quarter of this year well, that came out as a 4.1% increase. And again, a lot of that, I think, this is the first quarter, has to do with the minimum wage hikes that came into effect uh, in January of this year. And so that is pushing up uh, labor costs. Of course, later on, that will push down employment as employers react to uh, higher wages by firing workers. But, you know, of course, this is not all good news. You hear, oh, labor costs are up. That's good. Well, it's not necessarily good. I mean, it's good if you're the worker and you got a raise. But just because it costs your employer more to hire you doesn't mean you got a raise. You might have got a pay cut because a lot of the employment costs don't go to the workers. It just costs the employer money to comply with government rules and regulations or mandatory fringe benefits. So that's part of the unit labor cost. Wages are just part of the cost. You have all kinds of other costs that add on. And so it's not good news if labor costs are going up, but wages aren't. In fact, in some cases, labor costs can be rising so much that workers have to take a pay cut because that's the only way the employer can afford to keep keep employing them, giving the increasing labor costs. We got this Gallup job creation index for April, which dropped a bit from uh, from March. March was 32, dropped to 30. So I guess that's a negative, right? The number is getting smaller. That means fewer jobs 
being created. But here's where we got a little bit of better than expected news. Although if you look beneath the surface, uh, the news is not that good. If you look at some of the sub sub uh, uh, components, but the PMI, the April PMI, which was at uh, 51.3 last month, it was supposed to come in at 52 and it came in at 52.8. So that's a beat. It was better than estimate and it was net better uh, than the prior month. Although none of these numbers are good. They're still not high. It's just a bit of an improvement. We also got the ISM number for non-manufacturing. This is the service sector. And this number was still better than estimates. It was 54.5 in March. It was supposed to improve slightly to 54.7. Instead, it, it improved more to 55.7. But again, there's a lot of subcomponents in there, particularly in the employment sector, that should be troubling if you're if you're bullish and again you know you get some volatility in these numbers these we're still below where we were a year ago at this time in that number and we're still declining we're still lower than we were when the fed first hiked rates in december even if we've got a bounce and we also got factory orders that came out uh for march and here it was a little bit better on the March month, and the revision was a little bit worse. We had a drop of 1.7 in February, but but they revised that to down 1.9. But then in March, instead of a 0.6% back increase, we actually jumped 1.1%, right? Good news, we're manufacturing more. Well, it's really not good news because almost all that gain had to do with military. And then the rest of it had to do with higher prices, uh, so it, it really wasn't about more manufacturing. It was about prices going up for the things that were being bought. And again, the bulk of the increase, you take out the uh, military stuff that was purchased and we wouldn't have even made the consensus. So it's not a good thing that we're spending more money uh, buying stuff for the military. One thing I also wanted to talk about on this podcast, I was watching on CNBC today and they had Bill Gross was the guest. And he was talking with Michelle Caruso Cabrera who was actually pretty good. She's a libertarian. I actually had her as a guest on the Peter Schiff show back then when I was doing the daily radio show and uh, she was promoting her new book. And she was talking to Bill Gross about automation. And Bill Gross was actually saying that automation was lowering our standard of living, that because of automation, companies were replacing their workers with machines. And as a result, people were being thrown out of work and, and so this was lowering our overall standard of living, which is complete nonsense. And, you know, Michelle Caruso Cabrera, you know, did try to challenge him on it and said, wait a minute. I mean, when people are displaced by automation, that frees that labor up to do other things, right? She used the example of telephone operators. And if you ever watch an old movie and, and you see, you know, somebody making a telephone call in the 1940s, 1950s, you know, every time you wanted to make a call, you had to talk to an operator who would personally connect the line. She would have to like pull one, uh, you know, thing out of the wall, and, and, and she would have to pull it out of one hole and plug it into another hole, and and actually, you know, connect the call. There was an operator that you would actually talk to the operator, and you'd tell the operator, you know, what number you wanted to call, and 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 they would connect you. Now, obviously, once we'd started to automate this, we didn't need all these operators. So we, we eliminate a lot of jobs. But, you know, if we didn't do that, we, we couldn't even have cell phones today and pagers and all this stuff. If every time you wanted to send a message to somebody, a human being had to make sure that that individual message went through where right? it couldn't even happen. Uh, and so she points out, look, yes, we, we eliminated all those jobs, but we just freed up people to do other things, which is exactly what, what happened. And, you know, this has been going on since the dawn of time. People have been able to figure out better ways of doing things. People have had used tools that have, uh, you know, were labor-saving devices. That's why they call it a labor-saving device. You want to save on labor because labor is not unlimited, right? I, you, there's only so much labor that you have. One man can only do so much. But if you give him tools, then you make labor more productive, and then we can have more things. So you always want to find ways to increase the productivity of labor so that we can do more with what we've got. We can produce more stuff with less work. That's always a positive. But what Bill Gross said is, well, it's not working that way now. He says it may be in the past, uh, you know, innovation was good for us, but now it's bad for us because the people who are losing their jobs, they're not getting good jobs. They're, they're getting lower paying jobs or part-time jobs. And so therefore, technological investment, maybe it used to be a good thing, 
but now it's a bad thing, which shows you even people that are supposedly really smart, like Bill Gross, can say things that are really, really dumb. Because that was really dumb, because automation, innovation is always a good thing. We are increasing our standard of living because of it. Now, here's the problem, because what Bill Gross should be saying is, okay, automation and technology and labor-saving devices have been making living standards grow since the caveman, since the invention of the wheel. I mean, what did they do before the wheel? How inefficient was it to move something around when you didn't even have a wheel to roll it on, right? How many people were put out of, out of work by the invention of the wheel? Probably a lot of people, right? But we're certainly better off because we have wheels. But so why doesn't Bill Gross say, hmm, why is something that has benefited society, human beings, human civilization for thousands of years, why is it suddenly not working? Right? And the reason is because of the things that government is doing now that it wasn't doing in the past. It is the government that is the reason that people who are losing their jobs are not getting better jobs, are getting lower paid jobs. It's not because of the technology. In fact, if it wasn't for this technology, we would be even worse off. We would be losing even more jobs. I mean, here's an example. Let's say there's a company that automates. Let's say a company employs 1,000 people, and they automate. And because they automate, they fire 100 people. Now, let's say they didn't have access to the automation. And they had to continue to employ all the people. It's possible that under those circumstances, the business couldn't even survive. Maybe it was imperative to automate those functions. Because maybe without automating those functions, they wouldn't be competitive at all. And maybe all thousand workers would be fired. So they, they had to automate. You don't see the jobs that automation saves. You only see the jobs that are fired because they were personally replaced by a machine or, or a robot or, or whatever. But another point is that not all the automation that is taking place is automation that we actually want or that the consumer actually desires. Some of the automation is specifically geared as a result or consequence of government action. Right? For example, the automation of self-service when it comes to gasoline. A lot of people would prefer full service. I mean, I bet... If a gas station was there and they had full service and self-serve and it was the exact same price or maybe even full service was an extra couple of cents a gallon, most people would pull into the full service. They just assume not get out of their car and pump their gas and they like it when a guy washes their window for them and checks under their hood and check, fills up their tires with air. They like that, right? But because of the minimum wage, the cost of hiring that person is above what the consumer values that experience. If the fill-up is an extra five bucks, the guy would just assume get out of the car and wash his own windows and pump his own gas, you know, because of, of the cost. But that is a decision that is a consequence, not of just the ability to automate, but of the requirements imposed by government. And I bet a lot of the people who are about to lose their jobs because of the $15 minimum wage, it's not because of automation. It's not that people prefer to order their food from a, with a robot and be served by a robot or self-service. They might prefer personal service. They just can't afford it at the mandated minimum wage. So the government is causing automation to occur that in a free market wouldn't occur. Now, if there are certain things that are automated that um, that benefit the free market. Yes, I mean, people would prefer to have their phone calls connected automatically than have to go through a human being. And also, because the phone calls are connected automatically, they're a lot cheaper. You know how expensive it was to make a phone call You know, back in the day? I mean, I even remember when I was a kid uh, how expensive it was to make a long-distance phone call. I mean, my parents wouldn't make me lay, let me make long-distance phone calls, or if we had a long-distance phone call, we had to talk quickly. It's like, hey, you know, hurry up. It's long-distance. I mean, phone calls were expensive. And one of the reasons they were is because there were a lot more human beings involved in the process. And so by getting the humans out and the robots in and the machines in, the cost came down, and so everybody can enjoy uh, making more phone calls. But there are a lot of things where you prefer a person. And I mentioned, you know, whenever I get stuck in voicemail, I hate it. I want my phone calls answered by a human being. I really do. I, you know, but 
they, the companies can't afford it. So I get stuck in voicemail. And so none of this is because of uh, the market or technology. This is because of government. This is this is technology trying to figure out how to deal with government. And believe me, if we weren't able to automate, if we weren't able to find a way around hiring people because of these government laws that have artificially increased the cost of doing it, it would be even worse. Prices would be even higher. Even more jobs would be destroyed. Thank goodness for capitalism. What, what little we have left of it, we're still able to automate and, and, and advance so that we can survive all this big government. It is the computers and the robots that are helping to make us efficient enough to deal with all the government. But if we didn't have all this government, if we didn't have all these taxes, if we didn't have all these regulations, then some of the automation wouldn't be going on. And the people who were losing their jobs due to technology would be getting better jobs. They would be having higher paid jobs. It's not the technology that's preventing that. It's the government. There's so much factually incorrect information and underreporting by legacy media today. Shouldn't there be truth in media? Well, there is. Truth in Media. Recently, a novel thought is now a reality with truthinmedia.com. Led by award-winning journalist Ben Swan, truthinmedia.com is the source for uninfluenced, reliable, fearless news where journalists pursue real questions, not conspiracies. Make truthinmedia.com your default browser's homepage today and get breaking news and commentary that speaks the truth to power. It's also where you can tune into The Peter Schiff Show every week. Visit truthinmedia.com today. That's truthinmedia.com. Access to Truth and Media RS feed by visiting truthinmedia.com forward slash feed. Attention listeners, I have an urgent message for you. We're in the middle of a war. The global conflict is destroying the lives of millions without a single bomb being dropped. It's called the International Currency War, and your bank account has been drafted to fight. The victims in this conflict are our currencies, the dollar, the euro, the yen, the pound. They are all heading to zero as irresponsible central banks compete to see who can print the most the fastest. But there's one form of money politicians and central banks can't destroy, gold. Today, it's more important than ever to understand the value of gold in your portfolio and to keep a close eye on major market developments. Subscribe to my monthly video cast and you'll be the first to hear my latest analysis on gold investing and the currency wars. Visit goldvideocast.com right now to subscribe for free. I call the dot-com bust, then the housing bust, and I advise clients to diversify into foreign equities and hard assets while the rest of Wall Street laughed at me. Now I want to keep you up to date on the next crisis that is brewing. My gold video cast also includes personal interviews I've conducted with other contrarian investors like Jim Rickards and Axel Merck. Gold has gone up 256% since 2003, but it has a lot further to go. Don't miss the rally. You can prosper during this time of currency wars, but only if you stay educated. Get a free subscription to my gold video cast at goldvideocast.com. That's goldvideocast.com.